Welcome back, everybody, to the Miami Marlins franchise here on MLB The Show 23. Today, we will be finishing up season number one of the series with a jam-packed episode. We've got a few more weeks of the regular season. We're also going to be going over the minor league playoffs as well. Currently, our Marlins are 68-75. and 75. It doesn't look like we're going to get a playoff spot, unfortunately. So, I guess, hypothetically, if we did, then this wouldn't be the last episode of season number one. But the chances of that are a little bit unlikely. At the end of today's episode as well, we'll be nominating our candidates for the studs and duds of the year. For those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, watch the early portion of the last episode. Basically, we are going to reward players for playing well, and we're going to punish players for not playing well. And their ratings and potentials will see increases and decreases and i'm going to talk a lot more about that once we get to the end of today's episode when i introduced the idea of it in the last episode it seems like you guys really liked it but most of you guys think that my rewards and punishments were probably too extreme and i kind of agree so instead of doing plus five and minus five plus three and minus three plus one and minus one we're going to do it in increments of three two and one and again, this will be the case for both the majors and the minors. The AAA team is currently 69 and 69. Nice. Perfectly balanced as all things should be. I don't think the AAA Jumbo Shrimp will make the playoffs. However, the Pensacola Blue Wahoos in AA have won the division for the first half and second half of the season. So that means we are automatically going to our league's championship series. So we're going to simulate to the end of the minor league regular season along with the next two or so weeks in the major leagues and we're going to reassess where we are so the big league team did not do too well we are now 74 and 82 with two more series left to go both on the road against the mets and the pirates it is now official the marlins will not make the playoffs this year the triple a team finishes at 75 and 75 while the double a team won all six games of our final series allowing three runs in those six games that is nasty this double-A team is really, really good. And we're going to take a look here at the final stats for the minor leagues. And again, we're going to go deeper into guys who played really well and guys who did not play well at the end of the episode for our stud and dud of the year candidates. Here's a look at the AAA stats as well. What I'm going to do is for players on the AAA team who spent a lot of time in AA, I'm going to have them go back down to AA for the playoff run. If there's a guy who spent all year in AAA, we're not going to have them do that. I don't want to make our AA team like too good, but we are kind of basically forming the 2017 Warriors on our AA roster. So here you go, the minor league season's officially over. The Pensacola Blue Wahoos get a first round bye. And again, we are going all the way to our championship series as we try to win the whole thing against, well, we don't know yet. We're gonna find that out in a little bit. Finishing with a record of 46 and 23, we have the number one ranked team in double A. Here are the team statistics. Second in batting average, first in runs. We are first in hits. Our offense is insane. We are sixth in home run, so not as high, but still quite good. And then we are first in stolen bases. We, we're not just a bunch of good hitters. We can also run. Third in walks, which is quite good. Fourth in slugging percentage, also quite good. Second in on base percentage as well. I would actually tied for first, technically. But our pitching is also great. We're second in ERA, second in runs allowed. We are very high in all of the other statistics as well. Third in earned runs, basically second. One team is one less than us. Whoop de doo. So yeah, this pitching staff is nasty. Our hitting core is nasty, and we finished with by far the best winning percentage in all of Double A. We have no reason that we should not win our league's championship. So this is what the lineup is going to look like going into the Double A championship. We've got some ballers here at the top: Khalil Watson at leadoff. He's hit for great average. Gennaro Miller, the two-way star. Jacob Berry. He has been probably the best offensive player in all of Double A this year. He has raked at the plate. He started a little bit slowly, but in the summer months, he has been phenomenal. Jose Gerardo, great power back. Anthony Peguero, 17 years old, playing well out in center field. And then we've got other good position players like Jacob Amaya, Jordan Nwogu, Joe Mack, Victor Victor Mesa, Davison De Los Santos. In the rotation, Yuri Perez is back. He spent the first half of the year in double A. He was called up to triple A. 
He started off slowly in AAA, but he pitched a lot better over the last month or two. But since he spent a lot of time in AA, I think that it'd be cool to give him an opportunity here to help the team on their postseason run. But the real star of the rotation is Gennaro Miller. He's been the best starting pitcher in all of AA this year. And of course, he can hit as well with him being a two-way player. And then guys like Zach McCambly and Jeff Lindgren are really good arms in the middle of the rotation as well. And the bullpen is quite strong as well. So basically, we have a super team here in AA. Who will be facing off against in the Southern League Championship? It's going to be Birmingham. They are the AA affiliate of the Chicago White Sox. They beat the Tennessee Smokies in five games to make it here with a 6-1 win in the final game. Stever with a good outing on the mound. So we will be getting ready for the Barons here in our championship series. We'll be simcasting the first game with Yuri Perez on the mound against Ernesto Jaquez. We would score in the second inning. Joe Mack getting us started offensively. We love to see it. We would score again in the fifth and the sixth. We do allow a run in the seventh, but man, Yuri Perez is cooking. We're going to have him trying to go the entire way. And there you go, a complete game for Yuri Perez, the number one prospect in the organization. Joe Mack homered. Barry drove in a run as well. Zach Zubia had two. And Yuri Perez absolutely dominated. So that'll bring us into game two. Zach McCambly on the mound, a pretty underrated arm in our rotation. He has had a very good season for himself this year in double A. And if we can win this game, we will comfortably lead in the series. So far, not a lot of offense with Jesse Schultons on the mound for the Barons. Still scoreless going into the seventh, another scoreless inning. And I decided to hop in here in the top of the eighth inning. Game is tied at zero. I figured this would be a really good opportunity to hop in. It is downpouring here in Pensacola as McCambly looks to get through the eighth inning. Jacob Berry, I don't know what he's doing at third base, but Luis Mese singles into left field. We'll see if Birmingham can take advantage of the Blue Wahoos defensive blunder. Duke Ellis, the leadoff man, has two of Birmingham's four hits today. As this one looks like it could drop in the left. The runner's going to head for third, and he is unsurprisingly out. I do not know why they sent him. That was really stupid. So both teams with terrible blunders in the eighth inning. I guess they kind of cancel out. Bottom eight, the first baseman, Zach Zubia, leads off the inning, and he gets plunked. So he will reach his base. Both teams have not gone to the bullpen yet until now. Schultens is out of the game for the Barons. He'll be replaced by Sammy Peralta. The top of the order is up. We'll start with Khalil Watson, who hit their great contact this year. He barely was not qualified in the batting average leaders, but he almost was, and if he did, he would have been in second in the Southern League as he singles into right field. 2-1, one away for the best offensive player in double-A baseball this year across all leagues. It's Jacob Berry who lines it to first. What a play. That could have scored a run, but the first baseman makes an incredible grab. That'll bring up Jose Gerardo, who has incredible pop, particularly against left-handed pitching. He hits this one pretty well into right, but it is caught. So we are still scoreless through eight innings, looking to get into the ninth. Can either team score a run here, or will we be headed into extras? Zach McCambly is still in the game here, facing off against Brian Ramos. The 1-2. This one is hit into left. Jordan Nwogu chases after it. Zach McCambly technically with a complete game shutout. The only problem is we don't know if he's technically going to go the entire way because the offense has not scored either. Jose Cuas is in for Birmingham here in the bottom of the ninth inning, facing off against Jordan Nwogu. He will draw a walk on the low sinker, so he'll reach his base. And now there's a base runner aboard for Joe Mack. The catcher grounds it to second. The second baseman bobbles it, but he still gets the throw to first. And through nine innings, we have no runs here in game two of the AA Southern League Championship as we go into the 10th. McCambly taken out of the game for Pensacola. He'll be replaced by Jorge Mercedes. He will get Jose Godoy to go down looking. Another scoreless inning here this time from the bullpen. Still no runs going into the bottom of the 10th. Two away for the center fielder. It's Anthony Peguero, 17 years old, with a big hit in a right center. That'll go for a single. So that will bring up Jacob Berry, again, the best hitter in double-A baseball this year with an opportunity to win the game. And it'll be against Andrew Perez on the mound, who in .1 postseason innings has allowed three runs. Hopefully he allows two more here and we can finish this game off once and for all. Berry, again, the switch hitter, hitting from the right side of the plate as Peguero looks to steal second. And he is out of there! Pensacola tried to get him into scoring position and it backfires Still scoreless going into the 11th. 
Anthony Maldonado is in for the Blue Wahoos, the 25-year-old righty, making his first postseason appearance as he faces off against Jose Rodriguez, and he will draw a walk on the cutter. So that's an early base runner. That'll bring up J.J. Muna, who grounds it to first. Zubia over to Amaya. Back to Zubia. Bang! 3-6-3. Three, three. Double play. Good work by the Blue Wahoo defense. And now going to the bottom of the 11th. Look who's due up. Barry. Then we've got Gerardo. And then Gennaro Miller. We'll go two away here for Miller. He goes down looking. And the big three goes over three. And we are still scoreless going into the 12th. Paul Campbell is into the game now. This is a guy who's going to be able to he eat a bunch of innings. And that might be necessary because we have no clue if either team's going to get anything going offensively. Campbell starts off strong with a 1-2-3 inning, finished off by a Brian Ramos ground out. Let's go to the bottom of the 12 now. The longtime Major League veteran Jake Diekman is into the game for the Barons. Diekman has been bouncing around in the majors since 2012 and is a sub-4 ERA for his career in the big leagues. Now here in A as he faces off against Joe Mack. Little lefty on lefty crime. Mack hits this one well. Deep into center field and it is caught. So another 1-2-3 inning as we will now go into the 13th. Still no score here in Game 2 of the AA Championship Series. Craig Dedlow is up and he's going to line it to first. Nice play by Zubia with the flip over to Paul Campbell. Great defense by Zubia who has been phenomenal defensively these last couple of innings at first base. One away for Laz Rivera. He strikes out on the curveball. A filthy pitch by Paul Campbell who's been pretty much perfect so far through the first two innings. Retiring the side in both of them. Let's go bottom 13, top of the order, back up for Pensacola. It's Khalil Watson who strikes out on the sinker. Jake Diekman is not an innings eater, and he is still going multiple innings, it looks like. J.J. Muno strikes out looking early in the top of the 14th from Paul Campbell, who is still balling. Bottom 14, Diekman is still in the game, looking to get a third inning. As with one away, he faces off against Jose Gerardo who strikes out on the fastball, frustrated with himself as we still have no offense going into the 15th. Brian Ramos hits this one into left. It's caught another 1-2-3 inning. We have not had a base runner in this game for either team since the leadoff walk in the top of the 11th. That's how long it's been since there's a base runner. Neither team is giving any signs of life offensively. Jordan Nwogu draws a walk as Pensacola gets a runner aboard for the first time since the 10th. Lane Ramsey, by the way, is now on the mound for the Barons as he will face off against the catcher Joe Mack. One for five today. That's not too bad of a stat line considering what some of these other goofballs on this team have as he singles in a right. Okay, now we're seeing something here. There's two runners on. A base hit could end the game. Finally for Pensacola. Davison De Los Santos comes in off the bench as he strikes out on the outside fastball. Nice pitch by Ramsey. Now he will face off against Khalil Watson, one of the best contact hitters in all of double-A. His opportunity to be a hero. Hits this one decently well in the left, and it is caught. Through 15 innings, still no runs. Let's go to the 16th. Paul Campbell has thrown three perfect innings, and now he's going to make it four. Jose Godoy grounds out to second. What a game from Paul Campbell out of the bullpen but he's still not getting any run support. Again, we got the sweet spot of the order due up, though, but these guys have done nothing all night. Jacob Berry hitting from the left side of the plate now. He has hit for great power against righties this year, but he goes down looking on the low fastball from Ramsey. Jose Gerardo up next. He is also a very bad 0 for 6 as he strikes out again. Through 16 innings, we do not have any runs. Let's go to the 17th. J.J. Muno hits this one into left. That could go for extra bases. This is Birmingham's first base runner since early in the 11th inning. And Paul Campbell's perfect game, if you will, is snapped after four and a third innings. Now there's a runner in scoring position and a big opportunity for Eric Hernandez with two away. He hits this one high and deep in a right field. And this one is gone. We finally have runs. It took over 16 innings. But it has finally happened with a two-run shot by Eric Hernandez. And the Barons lead 2-0 in the top of the 17th. DJ Gladney will ground out to Campbell. What an outing for Paul Campbell. He was perfect, and now he's in real danger of taking the loss. Can the offense get things going now that they're facing off with a little pressure? 
That'll start with the two-way superstar, Gennaro Miller. He's 0 for 6. Hits it well to short. What a play for the first out of the inning. Miller, Gerardo, and Barry, the 3-4-5 hitters, are a combined 0 for 21 today. That's pretty bad. Jacob Amaya has two hits in this game, but he will line out to left. He did hit that ball well. And now Pensacola is down to their final out. Jordan Nuogu, one for four. He has reached base two other times with a pair of walks. So he's reached three times. That's pretty good compared to everybody else as he grounds it to third. Another ridiculous defensive play, and this game is finally over. 17 innings it took to get some offense. But the Birmingham Barons win this one by the score of 2 to nothing. When we hopped into the game in the 8th inning, I expected to only play a couple innings. Instead, I played 10. <laughs> and there was basically no offense the entire game, whether I was in or it was the CPU. I mean, their pitching was phenomenal, and our offense wasted a generational pitching performance by some of these guys. Nine hits and two walks in 17 innings. That's atrocious. We had zero extra base hits, and they didn't have any extra base hits until the 17th. Zach McCambly, nine innings shutout. The bullpen was also phenomenal, but they could not hold on. We practically just had two full games in one. That'll bring us to game three. We're now on the road. We've got Gennaro Miller on the mound, and we score three in the first inning, and we're going to score three more in the second. Where was this in game two? For the love of God. Gennaro Miller is dominating right now. We're going to take him out here in the seventh. We're up six to nothing. We feel pretty comfortable with our lead, and we hope Carson Milbrandt can make his way through the rest of the game, and that's what's going to happen. We win game three, six to nothing. Our offense, who did nothing in game two, did some early damage with a three-run double in the first by Jordan Nwogu and a three-run homer in the second by Jacob Berry. And shout-out to Gennaro Miller with six scoreless innings. Our starting pitchers in this series had thrown 25 innings and have allowed zero runs as we score three in the top of the first again. They would add one and two, but then we add two more. Keep in mind, this is an elimination game, by the way. If we win, we win the championship. We're going to hop in now in the eighth inning, trying to finish it off. We're up 5-2. to two. Jose Cuas is back in here for Birmingham. Just can't blow it. As this will start with two away here. Joe back. The catcher is up. Hits it well up the middle. And that will go for a single. So a base runner here aboard for the Pensacola Blue Wahoos. We'll see if they can capitalize and look to put themselves in a position to ice the game. Davis and De Los Santos will go down looking on the sinker. So Cuas gets out of the inning and we'll go bottom eight. Jeff Lindgren taken out of the game after seven very strong innings. He'll be replaced by Jacob Miller, who's going to look to finish out the game. J.J. Muno deflects it over to first. De Los Santos makes a nice play. Miller should have gotten to the bag quicker. I don't think it would have really mattered, but I don't know why he was lollygagging there on the mound. DJ Gladney up next. He's going to line this one well into right, and okay, we're in business. There's two runners aboard. The one runner is actually going to make his way over to third. So now there are two runners in base on the corners. The tie and run is up. It's Brian Ramos who strikes out on the four seam fastball. Big pitch by Jacob Miller. That'll bring up Craig Dedalo. The one two, swinging and miss on the fastball. Miller gets out of the jam as the Blue Wahoos are one inning away from winning. The double-A championship series for the Southern League. Sammy Peralta is into the game now in the ninth inning for the Birmingham Barons. He'll face off against Jacob Berry, the big third baseman, at a three-run homer in game three. As he's going to pop this swap in into the infield. So not a whole lot from the offense here down the stretch. But all they need to do is not allow three. And with how good the pitching has been throughout this entire series, you'd think they probably should be able to. Jose Godoy strikes out on the fastball, and now Pensacola is one out away. It's going to come down to the number eight hitter, Jose Rodriguez. Here's the 2-2 pitch. Miller got him on the slider, and the Pensacola Blue Wahoos have won the AA Southern League Championship in four games. Despite a heartbreaking 17-inning loss in game two, Pensacola is able to win the next two matchups and take it home. Our offense was pretty bleh throughout this championship series, but the pitching was phenomenal. In game one, Yuri Perez, nine innings, only allowed one run. In game two, Zach McCambly, nine shutout innings. The bullpen was great as well up until the 17th. In game three, Gennaro Miller, six scoreless. In game four, Jeff Lindgren, seven innings, two runs allowed. Our pitchers, or our starting pitchers, threw 32 innings in this series and allowed two runs. And the bullpen, for the most part, was really good as well. I wish the offense had played a little bit better, but they didn't need to. So Pensacola wins the championship. It's nice getting these guys to know what it's like to win because there's a lot of players on this double-A team. Perez, 
Barry, Watson, Gennaro Miller, guys who are going to be big leaguers in the future with our team. So for them to know how to win a series like this in the playoffs and specifically a championship is pretty big. So we're going to talk again about the minors later in the episode as we do our studs and duds of the year. But first, we're going to go back to the big league team. We're going to finish up the regular season as we would only win one of our next five games. We did have a nice game from Edward Cabrera, though. Six scoreless against the Mets. So that'll bring us to our final game of the year here against the Pirates. We are locked into the 10th overall pick. We cannot get past the Diamondbacks. We cannot fall below the Red Sox. So we're not really playing for draft position. We're just trying to have fun. And I would love to win one more game before the end of the year, although it will be without Gene Segura, who has a pretty bad headache. So there's no reason to play him. It's game 162, and we are here at PNC Park, one of the most beautiful stadiums in all of baseball. And the Marlins are going to get a little bit creative with what they're going to do with their pitchers. This was Trevor Rogers' start. However, it's going to go to Edward Cabrera instead. I think both Rogers and Cabrera are candidates for the stud of the year. And I think making this decision actually kind of helps out both of them. Trevor Rogers is not pitched well at all in the second half of the year, so I think not pitching him would do him well. And then Edward Cabrera is coming off a really good start against the Mets, so maybe he can keep his momentum going here. He'll face off against Rowanzi Contreras, who's had a really good year for the Pirates. They're hoping he can be a very solid young arm at the top of their rotation for years to come as he gets Xavier Edwards to go down looking. Let's take a look at Edward Cabrera, who's had an up-and-down season, but I think there have been a, mostly positives with him. He hasn't been all that great throughout the month of September, but he is coming off a good start against the Mets. He's not going to have his full workload today, but I think realistically, if he can get four or five strong innings, it would be nice to see him with another good outing before the end of the year as he gets G1 Bay to go down looking on the sinker. That's certainly Cabrera's best pitch. Now facing all against Brian Reynolds, he goes down on the curveball. A quick 1-2 Theranian for Cabrera. It feels weird to be here at PNC Park. I don't think I've played a game here since the Pirates franchise. All the way back in MLB The Show 20. Jesus Sanchez gets plunked, so he'll reach base. De La Cruz goes down on the slider. Nice pitch by Ronzi Contreras as we go bottom two. The young second baseman, Rodolfo Castro, hits this one down the line and fair. I thought he was going to think about two, but he is going to hold up at first with a single. Nonetheless, the Pirates do now the base runner. That'll bring up Cannon Smith and Jigba. He's going to ground this one over to Chisholm playing shortstop today. Tags the base. Close play at first, but they got him. Cannon Smith and Jigba, not the fastest for his position. Kind of like his brother, Jackson Smith and Jigba, who's going to be a first-round pick in the NFL draft in just a couple of days. Taylor Trammell rips this one into left center field for a hit. Trammell's gotten a lot of opportunity to play here in September. He hasn't been all that great, but the Marlins are hoping they can get something out of him here in the final game of the year. Xavier Edwards is back up. He's got a 3-1 count. Maybe shouldn't have swung at that pitch, but it doesn't really matter because he singles into right. And now the Marlins are in business. They've got two runners aboard with a nice opportunity to get on the scoreboard. Jazz Chisholm up next. He's going to hit this one down the line and fair. That should score a run. Chisholm will make this a double. Edwards thinks about going home. He maybe would have been safe, but he's going to head back to third. Nonetheless, it's an RBI double for Jazz Chisholm. And the Marlins lead it 1-0 with an opportunity to do some more damage. Jorge Soler hits this one high and deep in a right field at the track at the wall. It is caught. So Miami leaves two guys in scoring position. But they also drive one in with the double by Chisholm. Edward Cabrera really is capitalizing from the momentum of his last start as he gets Connor Joe to go down looking. Now against Cal Mitchell. Checks his swing. Umpire says he went around. Cabrera is looking really good through three innings. It's nice to see him pitch well here for the final game of the year. Brian De La Cruz leads off the fourth with a single into right. De La Cruz has had an up and down season. There's been some good and there have also been some bad, particularly defensively. Nick Fortes, the young all-star, grounds it up the middle. Pittsburgh going to look to turn two as Castro tags the base and gets it over to Smith and Jigba for the double play, a 4-3. Runner on first now for Taylor Trammell. He's got a 2-2 count pitch from Contreras, and he strikes out. Four strong innings for Juanse Contreras, who also has pitched pretty well for the most part, although his pitch count is kind of high. Here is Brian Reynolds, draws a walk here. Cabrera has now only allowed two base runners today. Jack Sawinski will also draw a walk, so the control is starting to get a little bit loose. Again, coming off of short rest, this is not a major surprise as Rodolfo Castro strikes out on the fastball. Four scoreless for Edward Cabrera. Again, if this was a normal start, he'd probably go longer, but since he just pitched a few days ago, 
His day will be done. Four innings, zero runs allowed. Very good start for Edward Cabrera. And again, if you compare that to Trevor Rogers, who was supposed to start today with Rogers' struggles, I'm not sure it would have been that good of an outing for him. Kyle Nicholas is in the game for the Pirates out of the bullpen. Rwanzi Contreras also done after four. As Luis Arias with one away will single into right center. Arias is hitting pretty much exactly 300. He wants to keep that average above 300 to end the year, and that will certainly help. Jazz Chisholm up next. He is the only player to drive in a run today. He had the RBI double in his last at bat. But this time he goes down looking on the outside fastball. Nice pitch by Nicholas for the second out of the inning. Jesus Sanchez reaches base for a second time today. He draws a walk. So now there's two runners on and a nice opportunity for Jorge Soler, who's had a very strong month of September offensively here for the Marlins. He will strike out on the curveball. Still 1-0 through the middle of the fifth. There's been, like, no offense throughout today's episode for the most part. Chichi Gonzalez will come out of the bullpen for the Marlins, his 10th outing of the year. He's been solid. He is an ERA barely above four in 19 innings so far as he faces off against Connor Joe, who hits this one into left center. That'll go for a hit, just the second base hit of the game for the Pirates, and they've got a runner aboard. Two away now for Chris Rabago. We'll see if Gonzalez can get out of the inning. He's got a one-two count, and Rabago will check his swing, and the umpire says he went around. Rabago is only a 53 overall, by the way. His hitting stats, well, they're not the best. Top six, one away for Nick Fortes. He's got a full count. He draws a walk on the inside fastball. The Marlins are getting more base runners than Pittsburgh, but they're not really doing anything with them. Two away now for Taylor Trammell. He's got a hit and a strikeout today as he strikes out once again, showing off that poor plate vision. Two good innings from Nicholas as we go bottom six. Gonzalez still in the game as he faces off against Cabrian Hayes, the talented third baseman, one of the best defensive players in baseball. He's had a breakout season offensively as well as he will double to start the inning. And the Pirates now the runner in scoring position. Hayes now at third for Brian Reynolds, who weakly chops this one over to Edwards. He'll flip it over to first, and Reynolds is out, but runner scores, and the Pirates have this game tied up at one. Jack Sawinski, the cleanup hitter, up next for the Pirates, and he will go down looking on the circle change. Two pretty solid innings for Chichi Gonzalez. He will allow one as this game is tied up going into the seventh. Nicholas still in the game for the Pirates as Xavier Edwards singles his second hit of the game. Good to see him playing well here down the stretch as he is aboard now for Jazz Chisholm. One array, 2-2 two -two count, and Chisholm will ground this one right over to second, and it'll be an inning ending, 4-6-3, double play. So let's go bottom seven now. The Marlins will make another pitching change here with Devin Smeltzer entering the game. The lefty, he's pitched 69 innings this year. Nice. 4.17 ERA. He's been pretty solid in limited opportunities here in the big leagues as he faces off against the second baseman, Rodolfo Castro, who hits a missile in the left field. That one is gone. Solo home run for Rodolfo Castro, showing off his big-time pop, especially against lefties. Is 22nd of the year, and the Pittsburgh Pirates take the lead as it is now 2-1. to one. Big swing by Rodolfo Castro. The Pirates' offense was quiet early, but over the last couple of innings against this Marlins bullpen, they're making some plays. Cal Mitchell hits this one down the line, and fair, that'll go for a hit. And so there's now a runner aboard here and another opportunity for the Pirates to extend the lead as Chris Rabago hits this one high and deep and a lift, and that one is gone. Chris Rabago, the catcher with his first big league home run, and the Pirates are now up 4-1. to Rabago's power stats are in like the 20s, so that's a little bit embarrassing, but still a nice swing as Devin Smelter taken out of the game after allowing a pair of homers. Jonathan Loisaga will come in. I think he has pitched very well since the trade deadline after being acquired by the Yankees. Runner on for Jihuan Bay, who flies out to left, caught by De La Cruz. Still a very good inning for the Pirates as they score three with a pair of homers by Castro and then the young catcher with the first of his career. Colin Holderman is in the game here in the eighth inning for the Pirates. 1.41 ERA as he will face off against Keston Hira. Coming in off the bench, looking to make his mark. Hira hits this one well in the left center, and that baby is gone. Solo home run for Keston Hira, his ninth of the year. And the Marlins are going to make it a little bit closer. It's now 4-2. Hira's had a pretty rough season since being acquired via trade from Milwaukee. 
His average is horrible. His on-base is horrible. But he does have some good power. Showing it here as the Marlins will make this game a little bit closer. Brian De La Cruz up next for Miami. He's going to ground this one off the middle. What a play at short by Ji Juan Bay to throw him out. Great glove. Bottom eight. Loisek is still in the game. He strikes out Jack Sawinski on the circle change for the second out of the inning. Looking to finish things off here against Rodolfo Castro, who homered in the last inning. Hits it well into center. Trammell with a nice play to track the ball. An inning and a third scoreless for Jonathan Loisega as we will enter the ninth inning. The Marlins down by two in what could be their final inning of season number one. Alex Vesia, the lefty, comes in for the save. The Pirates made a blockbuster trade early in the season with the Dodgers, acquiring Vesia and Bobby Miller, the Dodgers' number one prospect, in exchange for O'Neill Cruz. Jordan Groshans leads off the inning for the Marlins. One for three today. He will draw a walk. So there's a runner aboard. Tie and run is at the plate. It's Xavier Edwards, who has two hits today. Edwards will ground this one in to left. His third hit of the game. The tie and run is aboard, and the potential go-ahead run will be up at the plate. Two away now for Jazz Chisholm. It's a 2-2 count. The Marlins season down to their final strike. The pitch for Chisholm. He pops this one into left field. This one should be caught, and it will, by Jack Sawinski. And the Pirates win game 162 by the final score of 4-2. to two. And with that, season number one comes to a close for the Miami Marlins, who will finish with a record of 75-87. and 87. A little bit disappointing for a team who was over 500 at one point in the month of July. I believe the Marlins were exactly 500 at the All-Star break. But the team decided to sell a little bit at the deadline. And that certainly reflected how the team played over these last couple of months. The offense was not great today. We had plenty of base runners throughout this game. Nine hits, four walks, but we weren't consistently making plays with them on. Edward Cabrera was good. The bullpen was good. Minus the seventh inning. Devin Smeltzer really struggled. And the Pirates pitched well. Ronzi Contreras with four good innings. Kyle Nicholas gets the win. Vesia with the save. So with that, we officially finished season number one with a record of 75 and 87. We're going to take a quick look at the Major League stats now. We're going to go over some of the highlights and maybe lowlights. And then we're going to go into more detail about certain players who are eligible to be our studs or duds of the year. Obviously, our best offensive player this season was Jazz Chisholm. We wanted to see what he could do with a fully healthy season. And he wasn't fully healthy. He played 108 games. He missed around a month and a half throughout the summer. But I do think he played pretty well. He's not going to be a candidate for the stud of the year because he didn't really exceed expectations. But obviously, he played well and was by far our best position player. Everybody else in terms of the lineup was pretty, like, average. We didn't have any other standout performers. Chisholm was the only guy who finished with an OPS above 800. Into the rotation, of course, Sandy Alcantara was also phenomenal this year. He was almost just as good as he was last year. Basically the same amount of innings, same amount of hits allowed, runs allowed, slightly more homer, less walks, less strikeouts, lower ERA, basically identical whip, same amount of quality starts and complete games, but five of those complete games were shutouts. His war, however, was quite a bit lower than last year, but he was still great, and we have him for four more years on a super team-friendly deal. The rest of the rotation had their ups and downs. Rodgers and Cabrera had their good moments. Braxton Garrett played well down the stretch. Jesus Luzardo obviously was disappointing, and then the bullpen, for the most part, was not the best. So with that, we are now going to do our stud and duds of the year. We have three winners and three losers across the majors and the minors, and of course, they will be decided by you guys. There is a straw poll in the description for you to go and vote. I'm going to let you know about who the candidates are. So for the big league team, I had a hard time picking three. I ended up choosing five. There will still only be three winners for the stud of the year, but we have five nominees. First place will get plus three to their overall and potential. Second place will get plus two to both. Third place will get plus one to both. The first candidate is Gene Segura. He was a little disappointing early in the season, but he played very well towards the second half of the season. He was second in terms of OPS and war amongst position players on the roster, and he had the fifth highest war amongst third basemen in the National League, 21st overall. In terms of our young guys, I didn't really know who I wanted to do, but I ended up going with Nick Fortes over guys like Arise, De La Cruz, and Sanchez. 
Fortes did not put up elite offensive stats, but you got to keep in mind, he played the catcher position and he played it well. He finished second in gold glove voting, 2.9 war, 34th in the National League, fifth among catchers. We've got three pitchers. The first one is Edward Cabrera. His numbers are not as good as last year, but he pitched a lot more innings than last year. So he was able to keep up a high sample size and he still pitched quite well. And statistically, he was arguably our second best starter. He had a great season on the bump for us and is going to be a mainstay in the rotation for years to come. We're also going to nominate fellow starter Trevor Rogers. I know his numbers don't look great for an 81 overall, but he was bad all of last year. This year, he was only bad for the second half of the year. During the first half of the season, he was really good. And in terms of some statistics, he finished better than Cabrera. More quality starts. He finished with a higher war than Cabrera as well despite pitching in less games. So he did struggle down the stretch, but he was really good early on. And most of his advanced numbers are pretty similar to that of Cabrera. Braxton Garrett is the fifth and final candidate for the stud of the year. He pitched basically the same amount of innings as these guys, but he only started in 12 games. And he came out of the bullpen for 32 of them. Of his 12 starts, six of them were quality starts. He had the second highest war amongst all pitchers on the roster, only behind Sandy Alcantara. So those are our five candidates for the stud of the year. Let's meet our three candidates for the dud of the year. The first one is Keston Hira. I wanted to focus on guys who have been on the team the entire year, but I think Keston Hira played enough 206 at bats for it to be a decently large sample. And well, he was horrible. He finished with a war of negative 1.2, the lowest of any position player on the roster. Jesus Luzardo is the second candidate. He was not good for most of this year. I will say he did have a good month of September, but other than that, he was quite bad. I still view him as a long-term piece in the rotation, but I'd be lying if I said I was not disappointed by how he played for the first five months of the year. He finished with a negative 0.3 war. The final candidate is going to be Dylan Floro, and this is a little weird one. He wasn't horrible, and a lot of his advanced numbers are actually pretty good. However, he was our closer this year. He did blow a number of games, and he had his worst ERA and whip over the last five years. He did not live up to expectations, contrary to what he's done recently. He did have a positive war, though, and a lot of our other relievers did not. But again, this is largely based on expectations. And although Floro had good advanced numbers, he had a really good FIP, but some of the other numbers are just not really there. So he is the final candidate for the Major League Dud of the Year. Now I will be naming the candidates for our minor league stud and duds of the year. I opened up an old save file from where we started today's episode out. I thought I had one saved at the end of the minor league regular season. This is not exactly the end of the regular season, but it basically is. So here are our three candidates. The first one is Jacob Berry, third baseman on the double-A team. We talked about it earlier. Jacob Berry has absolutely raked this year 2.4 war the advanced numbers. The regular stats, all very good across the board. Second in batting average for the Southern League. He was first in hits, first in doubles, first in homers, first in RBIs. Yeah, he was really good. He was also second in runs, third in on-base percentage, and he was first in slugging and first in OPS. He was the best offensive player in the AA Southern League. However, Gennaro Miller was the best pitcher in the AA Southern League. 164 innings. He ended up finishing with a sub-2 ERA, but again, this does not count for his last start. So his ERA is technically a little bit above two, but it's still really good. He finished with a war at around five. This accounts, I believe, for both his hitting and his pitching. The advanced numbers are really good. He finished first amongst all Southern League pitchers in ERA by a landslide. The next highest was at 2.6. Least amount of home runs, very high in strikeouts, second in innings pitched, least amount of walks allowed for qualified starters, first in whip. He was dominant, but he's not just a pitcher. He can hit the ball, and he was a very productive player offensively. 12 homers, 274 average, 787 OPS. It's basically the AL MVP race from last year. Do you go with the best offensive player in baseball, or do you go with the two-way star? The third and final candidate will be Jeff Lindgren. For a lot of the st statistical categories that Gennaro Miller did not lead for pitchers, Jeff Lindgren did. He had a war barely below four and was really, really good as well. As for our three dud of the year candidates, the first one is Troy Johnston, a first baseman in AAA. We expected him to be pretty good offensively, and he was not. Simply put, for a first baseman, you got to be able to hit the ball, and he did not. Peyton Burdick is our second candidate. He's a guy with major league experience who just did not play all that well. 6-4-5 OPS, negative war. 
The final candidate is Huascar Brazoban. He pitched in the big leagues last year and he was actually pretty good. However, in AAA, he was not good. Nearly a whip at two, ERA was not great, negative war, just not a very good season for him. So again, there is a straw poll in the description where you can vote for our stud and duds of the year in the majors and the minors. Let's recap the entire season as a whole. The Blue Jays, Guardians, and Rangers won their divisions in the American League with the Yankees, Twins, and Astros grabbing wild card spots. The Rays, White Sox, Angels, and Mariners barely missing out. In the National League, the Philadelphia Phillies grab a wild card spot. The Atlanta Braves win the division, taking 100 games. The Cubs, 93 and 69, win the Central. The Cardinals get a wild card spot. The Dodgers won 107. They were by far the best team in the league. The Padres grab a wild card spot with the Giants and Mets barely missing out. As for the major awards, George Springer takes home the American League MVP. I guess he has now beaten the trash can allegations. Jacob DeGrom in his first year as a Texas Ranger takes home the Cy Young. Kyle Farmer wins the batting title, second straight year. A Twins infielder wins it. Last year, it was Luisa Rives, who, of course, is now with us. Clay Holmes wins the reliever of the year. Gunnar Henderson wins the rookie of the year over a couple guardians, Kodai Senga and George Valera. And George Springer wins the Hank Aaron. In the National League, it goes to a starting pitcher, Spencer Strider of the Atlanta Braves. Max Scherzer was dominant through the first half of the year. He cooled off in the second half of the year to have an ERA at 1.58, but they're going to give the MVP to Strider over Scherzer and his teammate, Austin Riley. Strider wins for Cy Young. No Sandy Alcantara in the top three. Scherzer and Urias are second and third. Brandon Nemo led all National League position players in war. He also wins the batting title. Joe Manaply, reliever of the year. Rookie Sasaki beats out known rookie Fernando Tatis for the rookie of the year. And then Bryce Harper with the Phillies wins the batting title. Our only award candidates were Nick Fortes and Gene Segura, who finished in second place for their gold gloves. Obviously, Segura is not beating out Nolan Arenado, who's probably the best defensive player of our generation. So this is what the playoff bracket looks like. We're going to simulate through the wild card round, take a look at some interesting results. The Astros sweep Minnesota, the Rangers sweep the Yankees, the Cardinals sweep the Padres, and the Phillies upset the three-seed Chicago Cubs. That'll bring us now to the NL and ALCS. The number one seeded Blue Jays lose to the Astros in four, while Cleveland escapes away from the Rangers. In the National League, the Dodgers beat the Cardinals 3-1. to one. And the Phillies do exactly what they did last year. It's literally identical from last season where they upset the Atlanta Braves in four games. However, Philadelphia's Cinderella run comes to a close. The Dodgers win in six, while in the American League, the Guardians beat the Astros in seven. So that will set up our World Series between the Dodgers and the Guardians. The Dodgers were definitely the best team in baseball this year. They are the heavy favorites, but it is the Dodgers. They choke every year in October. The Cleveland Guardians are a young, hungry team looking to get the job done. Keep in mind, they are without Shane Bieber, who tore his rotator cuff all the way back in spring training. So the Guardians win game one and game two. Look at Cleveland, two road wins. And then they win game three. The Guardians lead the World Series three to nothing. The Dodgers take a very important game four. That'll bring us to game five. And there you go. The Cleveland Guardians upset the Los Angeles Dodgers in the World Series. So congratulations to Cleveland for winning a championship. And again, they did this all without Shane Bieber, who did not pitch a single inning this year. But he's going to be back next year. So this team should be scary. Freddie Freeman and Jose Ramirez win the playoff MVPs. Not a major surprise. Two superstar level players. And then Ahmed Rosario wins the World Series MVP. Seeing a team like Cleveland win the World Series should give us some hope. A small market team who, not too long ago, was not a very good team. Obviously, I did the Guardians last year for my MLB The Show franchise. So the fact that just two seasons ago, they were bad enough for me to pick them and now are winning the World Series kind of shows that maybe these baseball rebuilds don't have to take a super long time if you're smart with how you rebuild. So who knows? Maybe our Marlins can become good sooner than we expect. That'll wrap up the episode. I hope you guys enjoyed the first season of this series. Next episode will be the offseason, a huge opportunity to really revamp this roster and make it our own. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you are new. Peace out.